Chapter 20 of the Bobsey Twins at Cedar Camp Snowball Bullets About the time that Bert Bobsey was running through the snow to get away from the wildcat, Flossie and Freddie were having a scare of their own. Some miles distant from him, though in the same wood around Cedar Camp, the two smaller Bobsey twins had gone off without letting their father and mother know, taking with them a lunch. They tramped through the forest until they came to a lonely place and had not yet caught sight of their father who'd started off ahead with old Jim Bimby and Tom Case. Right here, the small twins heard a growl and saw movement in the bushes. What's that? asked Flossie, shrinking closer to Freddy. I, I don't know, Freddy answered, trying to think of something to make him brave. Maybe it's a bear. A bear? questioned his sister. Yup, Freddy went on, his eyes never moving from the bush that seemed to hide some animal. Maybe it's a bear like the one we found the skin of in the attic. It, it can't be the same one coming back for his skin, can it? asked Flossie. Of course not, declared Freddy. How could a bear go round without his skin on? Well, a bear's skin is just the same as our clothes are to us, Flossie went on. And sometimes, when we go swimming, we don't have very many clothes on. Well, a bear is different, said Freddie. Oh, look, suddenly cried the little girl, and pointing to the bush with one hand. She clung to Freddie's arm with the other. He's coming out! He's coming out! she exclaimed. A shaggy head could be seen thrusting itself from the bushes. And the children were wondering, what sort of animal could it be? For it did not look like a bear. When with a joyful bark, there burst out in front of them the shaggy dog belonging to Tom Case. Rover, Rover was the name of the dog, rushed towards Flossie and Freddy, leaping joyfully and wagging his tail. He had made friends with the children as soon as they came to Cedar Camp, and they loved Rover. Oh, hello, cried Flossie, as if greeting an old friend. He's glad to see us, and we're glad to see him, said Freddy. This seemed to be true, though I think Flossie and Freddy were more pleased to see Rover than he was to see them, for the dog knew how to find his way home and even trace and find his master if need be. While to tell you the truth, Flossie and Freddy were lost, though they did not know it yet, but they were soon to find this out. Did you come looking for us? asked Flossie as she patted the shaggy animal. I guess he did, Freddy said. I guess he'd rather come with us than Daddy and the others, though we'll take Rover to him, won't we? Yes, agreed Flossie, but we must hurry up and catch him, Freddy. We want to see Mrs. Bemby and tell her about the nice warm bear robe. Shush, don't speak too loud, cautioned Freddy, looking over his shoulder. Why not? Flossie wanted to know. I mean about the bear robe, her brother went on. There might be some bears in the woods, and if they heard there was the skin of one of them at the cabin, maybe they wouldn't like it. Maybe that's so, agreed Flossie, also looking around. But anyhow, Rover drive the bears away, wouldn't you, Rover? The dog barked and wagged his tail, which was the only answer he could give. It satisfied the children, and soon they started off again, making their way through the snow hoping they would soon catch up with their father, Mr. Case and Mr. Bimby. Rover accompanied Flossie and Freddy, sometimes ahead of them and sometimes behind. The dog had started out, as he often did, to follow his master, but had lagged behind, perhaps to run after a rabbit or squirrel. Then he'd come across the tracks of the children and had gone to them knowing they were friends of his. I'm hungry, said Flossie after a while. Let's sit under a Christmas tree and eat, Freddy. All right, agreed her brother, always willing to do this. They were just then in a clump of evergreen trees, and under some the snow was not as deep as it was in the open. In fact, the children found one tree with no snow under it at all. So thick were the branches, and so close to the ground did they come. Crawling into this little nest, where the ground was covered with the dry needles from the pines and other trees, Flossie and Freddie opened the package of lunch they had brought with them. 
Rover, smelling the food, crawled into the shelter after them, and Flossie and Freddy shared their lunch with the dog, who even ate the crumbs off the ground. But we mustn't eat everything, said Freddy, when part of the lunch had been disposed of, Rover getting his share. Why not? asked Flossie. Can't you eat all you want when you're hungry? It's best to save some, Freddy said. Maybe we'll get stuck in the snow and can't get anything more to eat for a while, and then we'll be glad to have this. That's so, agreed Flossie, after thinking it over. I guess I'm not so very hungry, but Rover is. He's terribly hungry, Freddy. See him look at the lunch. Indeed, the dog seemed to be following, with hungry eyes, every motion of the little boy, who was wrapping up again that part of the lunch not eaten by him and his sister. They saved about half of it. Rover sniffed and snuffed as only a dog can, but he made no effort to take the lunch that Freddy placed in the crotch of the evergreen tree, which made such a nice shelter for him and his sister. Don't you take it, Rover, cautioned Flossie, shaking her finger at him. Rover thumped his tail on the ground, perhaps to show that he would be good and mind. It's nice and warm in here, Freddy remarked after a while. I wish we could stay here longer, Flossie. Can't we? Not if we want to go to Miss Bemby's, Freddy answered. We have to get out and walk some more, and it's snowing again, too. Whether it was or not, the children could not quite be certain, for the wind was blowing, and if the flakes were not falling from the sky, they were blowing up off the ground. It was almost the same anyhow, for there was a fine shower of the cold white flakes in the air, and it was much more cozy and warm under the tree than out in the open. Let's stay here a little longer, begged Flossie. Rover likes it here, don't you? She asked as she reached out her hand and patted the shaggy back of the dog. And from the manner in which Rover thumped his tail on the ground, you could tell that he did indeed like to be with the little Bobsy twins under the shelter of the tree. I know what we can do, said Freddy, after thinking a moment. I know what we can do to have some fun. What? asked Flossie, always ready for anything of the sort. We'll throw a lot of these pine cones outside and Rover will chase after them and bring them back, went on Freddy. He likes to run out in the snow, and after we play that a while, maybe it will be nicer outside. All right, agreed Flossie. We'll throw pine cones. There were many of these on the pine needle covered ground beneath the sheltering tree. The cones were really the clusters of seeds from the tree, and they'd become hard and dry, so they made excellent things to throw for a dog to bring back. Rover liked to race after sticks when thrown by the children, and the pine cones were ever so much better than sticks. There were so many of them, too. I'll throw first, and then it will be your turn, Flossie, Freddy said. Here, Rover! He called to the dog as he picked up several of the cones. Always ready for a lark of this sort, Rover leapt to his feet and stood at attention. Freddy bent aside some of the branches and tossed a pine cone out of the opening. It fell in a bank of snow some distance away, for Freddy was a good thrower for a little boy, and the pine cone, being light, did not sink down in the snow as a stone would have done. Bow wow, barked Rover as he dashed out after the pine cone. That was his way of saying he would bring it back as quickly as he could. And as Rover rushed from under the little green tent of the pine tree, Flossie gave a cry of surprise. What's the matter? asked Freddy, turning around to look at his sister. Rover knocked me down, she answered with a laugh. And surely enough, there she was, sprawling on the brown pine needles which covered the ground under the tree. He just bunked into me and knocked me over. Rover was not used to playing with children, you see, and he was a bit rough, but he didn't mean to be. Flossie sat up, still laughing, for she was not in the least hurt. By this time, Rover had brought back the pine cone that Freddy had tossed out. Good dog, Rover, cried Freddy, patting the animal as he laid down the cone and wagged his tail. Now it's your turn to throw one, Flossie, Freddy said. All right, Flossie answered, but look out he doesn't knock you down, Freddy. I'm looking out, Freddy said, and he quickly moved over to one side of the space under the tree while Flossie threw out her cone. Flossie was not quite so good a thrower of sticks and stones or pine cones as was her brother, but she did pretty well. Though her cone did not go as far as Freddy's had, it sank further down into the snow, 
Maybe the cone was a heavier one, or it may have fallen in a softer place in the snow. Anyhow, it went quite deep into a drift, and Rover had to dig with his forepaws to get it so he could take it in his mouth. Oh, look at him, cried Flossie, as the dog digging away made the snow fly in a shower back of him. He's like a snowplow on the railroad. Once, in a big storm, Flossie and Freddie had seen the railroad snowplow, pushed by two locomotives, cut through a high drift, and the way Rover scattered the snow made the little girl think of the snowplow. Bring it here, Rover, cried Freddie, for it would be his turn to throw a cone next. Bow wow, barked the dog, and then with a final dive into the drift, he got the brown cone in his mouth and came racing back with it. Covered with snow as he was, he crawled under the shelter to be petted and talked kindly to by Freddie and Flossie. Then, just as he probably did when he came out of the water in the summertime, Rover gave himself a shake to get rid of the snowflakes. Oh, oh, laughed Flossie, holding her hands over her face. Stop it, Rover. You're getting me all snow. But Rover kept it up until he had gotten off all the snow, and then he raced out again after more cones as the children threw them. If Bert Bobsey could have known where his little sister and brother were, with Brave Rover beside them, I'm sure he would have wished to join them, for Bert was about this time running away from the wildcat that had suddenly burst through the bushes. You're not going to get me, said Bert to himself, as he clutched his package of lunch and raced on as well as he could. The pain in his leg bothered him, but he was not going to stop for a thing like that and let a wildcat maul him. On he ran through the snow, taking the easiest path he could find. He looked back over his shoulder once or twice to find the wildcat bounding lightly along after him. And after he had looked back and had seen the size of the animal and noticed that there was only one, somehow or other, Bert became braver. He had an idea that perhaps he might drive this beast away. Wildcats, or bobcats as they're sometimes called, being also known as the bay lynx, are not as large as a good-sized dog. They weigh about 30 pounds, and though they have sharp teeth and claws, they very seldom attack persons. Only when they're disturbed or fear that someone is going to harm their little ones or take away their food do bobcats run after persons. And this one must have thought Bert was going to do it some harm, for the animal certainly chased the lad. Ho! said Bert to himself as he looked back. You're not so big. Maybe you've got sharp teeth and claws, but if you don't get near me, you can't hurt me. I'm going to make you go back. Bert had a sudden idea of how he might do this, with snowball bullets. All about him was snow, piles of it, and Bert had often taken part in snowball fights at home. He was a good thrower, and once he had snowballed a savage dog that had run at Flossie and Freddy, and had caused the animal to run yelping away. I'm going to snowball this wildcat, decided Bert. He ran on a little further until he came to a small clearing, where the trees stood in an irregular ring around an open place. There, Bert decided to make a stand and see if he could not drive the chasing wildcat away. And if he won't go and comes after me, thought Bert, I can climb a tree. He did not know, or else had forgotten, that wildcats themselves are very good tree climbers. Reaching the other side of the clearing, Bert laid his package of lunch down on a firm place in the snow and then rapidly began to make some hard round balls. He packed them with all his might between his mittened hands, for he knew a soft snowball would not be of much use against a wildcat. He had been some distance ahead of the animal, and when it ran up to the edge of the clearing, Bert had several snowballs ready. Come on now, see how you like that, cried the boy. He threw one snowball bullet, but he was so excited that it went high over the head of the bobcat. The next one struck in the snow at the feet of the animal, but the third one hit right on the nose. Good shot, cried Bert. The wildcat uttered a snarl and a growl and stopped for a moment. Perhaps it had never before chased anyone who threw snowballs. Have another, cried Bert and the next white bullet struck it on the side. The bobcat leapt up in the air, and then Bert threw another ball, which hit it on the head. This was too much for the creature. 
With a loud howl, it turned and ran back into the woods, and Bert breathed easier. Well, I guess as long as I can throw snowballs, you won't get me, he said to himself as he picked up the package of lunch and hurried on. End of chapter 20